Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and today is November 27th, 2018, as I'm recording this, and I'd like to talk about some of the remarkable events in the past couple of weeks and the insights that an understanding of the celestial system that underlies the world's ancient myths and scriptures and sacred stories can help us to see about these recent remarkable news events. How understanding the connection between the world's ancient myths and the stars can open up a new window on some of the events that have been taking place recently in the month of November in the year 2018. When I was in seventh grade, I took a memorable Latin class from an outstanding teacher who was also our teacher of ancient history. The Latin class used as its course text a series of soft-bound orange booklets published by the Cambridge University Press featuring the adventures of a family in Pompeii centered around a banker named Caecilius and his wife Metella and their son Quintus and a host of other characters including the slaves Grumio and Clemens and the beautiful Melissa and of course the family dog Kerberos. During the course of that Latin class and the adventures of Caecilius and his family we learned a lot about Pompeii a Roman town in southern Italy which was buried by the eruption of Vesuvius Mons the volcano in the year AD 79, preserving many buildings and pieces of art along with the body positions of the thousands of unfortunate men, women, boys and girls, and dogs who were overtaken by the scalding hot pyroclastic clouds and poisonous vapors that poured down the sides of the volcano when it erupted. So therefore, I was very interested to learn about the recent discovery of a fresco on the wall of a cubiculum in a buried Pompeian villa which was discovered two weeks ago in mid-November 2018 during new excavations. The fresco depicts a mythological episode known as Leda and the Swan, in which the god Zeus, who is known as Jove or Jupiter to the Latins, seduces the mortal woman Leda, who is the queen of Lacedemia and the wife of King Tyndareus, while the god is in the form of a swan. This particular fresco, which has lain undisturbed and unseen beneath the ashes of Pompeii for over 1,939 years, is remarkable for its frank sensuality and high artistic quality, and especially for the fact that the ancient artist has depicted Leda as fixing her arresting gaze upon the viewer, no matter where that viewer stands. Park director of the Pompeii site, Massimo Osana, declared that, quote, Lita watches the spectator with a sensuality that's absolutely pronounced, end quote. We could say that it's an ancient example of what's called breaking the fourth wall. As I've written in many places, including in my 2016 book, Star Myths of the World, Volume 2, Mythology of Ancient Greece, the god Zeus in ancient myth is associated with the constellation Hercules in the night sky, the constellation Hercules. The constellation Hercules often plays the role of the most powerful god or hero in any myth system from various cultures. And often, when Hercules is playing the role of a god, it will be the god who wields the thunderbolt weapon, as Zeus does 
in the myths of ancient Greece and of the Latins, where he's known as Jupiter. We can see clear evidence in ancient artwork of Zeus being associated with the form of the constellation Hercules in the infinite realm of the night sky. For example, in this piece of ancient pottery from the 6th century BC, currently located in Munich, we see the god Zeus depicted in a battle with the monster Typhon, whom Zeus finally defeats by imprisoning beneath a mountain. Zeus throws Mount Etna onto Typhon. In this artwork, we can see that Zeus is depicted in a deep forward lunge posture, holding the thunderbolt weapon overhead, in a posture, in other words, which corresponds very closely to the actual outline of the constellation Hercules in the heavens. Myths featuring a god or hero corresponding to the constellation Hercules will often have that figure battle an adversary associated with constellations below Hercules, such as Ophiuchus or Scorpio, both of which are located directly below Hercules in the night sky, Ophiuchus directly below Hercules, Scorpio below Ophiuchus. And in this case, Typhon, as envisioned by the ancient artist, can clearly be seen to be a kind of composite figure combining aspects of both Ophiuchus and Scorpio. He has a human torso and a serpentine lower body, just as Ophiuchus appears to be rather rectangular but human outline, uh, the legs of which are rather faint. But Ophiuchus has a very distinctive torso and then is directly above the serpentine form of Scorpio. So it's like a human torso over a serpentine uh, lower body. In the myth itself, I believe that Typhon most likely corresponds to Scorpio, which plays a great serpent or a dragon in many myths and scriptures. And in that myth, where Zeus finally imprisons Typhon under Mount Etna, I believe that Ophiuchus plays the role of the mountain, Etna, itself, under which the god crushes Typhon and imprisons the monster forever. Mount Etna, of course, is a volcano, and when it erupts, it was seen as Typhon underneath the mountain, you know, spewing forth uh, his, his fire, uh, even though crushed underneath the mountain. However, Zeus is not only famous for his overwhelming power to defeat his enemies and hurl the thunderbolt and throw mountains, he's also well known for his amorous affairs, described in many mythical episodes, and these two can frequently be interpreted as being directly founded upon the interaction between the constellation Hercules and constellations below Hercules in the heavens. For example, in one famous episode, the beautiful mortal woman Danae is locked away by her father, Acrisios, because he has been told by an oracle that the son of his daughter, Danae, will eventually slay him. In order to prevent Danae from ever having a son, Acrisius locks her away in a bronze chamber and forbids any from entering. However, the god Zeus descends in a shower of gold and comes through the ceiling of the bronze prison containing Danae and she thus becomes pregnant with a child who will be the hero Perseus. This shower of gold can easily be seen to be represented in the heavens by the glorious column of the Milky Way galaxy, which pours down through the sky adjacent to Zeus, having its brightest and widest region of the Milky Way located just between the constellations Scorpio and Sagittarius below Hercules. Sagittarius often plays the role of a goddess or of a beautiful maiden and thus may represent the figure of Danae in this particular episode. It's also possible that the rectangular figure of Era, the altar, just below Sagittarius and Scorpio and right in the middle of the Milky Way band, could play that 
bronze chamber play the role of that bronze chamber in which Acrisios imprisons his daughter and down through which the shower, uh, when Zeus takes on the form of a shower of gold, uh, can seem to be pouring. Another of the myth episodes describing the amorous adventures of the god Zeus describes a naiad named Aegina, who was carried away by Zeus when he took the form of an eagle. Once again, below the constellation of Hercules, we find the constellation that plays the eagle in the figure of a constellation called Aquila, which is located just above Scorpio and Sagittarius. And from this, we can readily see how the constellation Aquila could be envisioned as the god Zeus taking on the form of a powerful eagle in order to carry away the naiad, Aegina, who in this myth is played by Sagittarius. In another similar episode, Zeus fixes his affections on a nymph named Boetus, but she tries to avoid the god's attentions by taking on the form of a she-goat and trying to escape that way, but not successfully. She is caught by Zeus and she becomes pregnant and gives birth to a god named Egypan. It shouldn't be difficult to see that the beautiful nymph Boetus in this story also begins as Sagittarius, which is when Zeus notice her, notices her, but then she turns herself into the form of a goat, represented by the zodiac constellation Capricorn, immediately adjacent to Sagittarius. So now we can readily see when we turn to the story of Leda and the Swan that it also has a celestial foundation. In this case, the god takes on the form of a swan, and immediately above the constellation Aquila in the night sky, also in the Milky Way, we see the form of the constellation Cygnus the swan flying downwards towards Aquila and below Sagittarius. Uh, so Cygnus is flying down towards uh, Aquila, but also towards Sagittarius, in other words. So in this myth, the god, who's normally associated with the powerful figure of the constellation Hercules, takes on the form of a swan, represented in the nearby constellation of Cygnus, and then descends along the Milky Way to have amorous relations with Leda, who again is most likely represented by the figure of Sagittarius. It's not uncommon for constellations such as Sagittarius to play many similar figures but in different myth episodes. For example, Scorpio, which we just talked about playing the role of Typhon, also plays the role of the nine-headed Hydra, who's the adversary for a different Hercules figure. In other words, Scorpio can play Typhon in the story of Zeus battling Typhon, but Scorpio can also play the Hydra in the story of Heracles battling the Hydra. Indeed, there's another myth episode in which Zeus seduces a princess named Phthia, the daughter of Pheronius. In that story, Zeus takes on the form of a dove, also likely associated with that descending figure of Cygnus the swan in the heavens. It could be interpreted as a dove flying downwards through the Milky Way towards Sagittarius. So very few, if any, commentators upon the discovery of that ancient fresco from Pompeii would be able to point out that celestial connection underlying the story of Leda and the swan. But I believe that the ancients understood some of these esoteric meanings, uh, the esoteric metaphors. When we understand that the myths of ancient Greece and Rome, including this one, are based on a system of celestial metaphor, then we can begin to see how that same system 
underlies virtually all of the world's ancient sacred stories and myths and scriptures and connects them all together. And then what might seem at first glance to be a fairly bizarre and outlandish myth can actually be seen to convey a deeper meaning and it can begin to make sense because it's actually esoteric. It's using the stars as a means of making visible to us truths about the invisible realm in a deep metaphor. In the case of these particular stories that we've been talking about, about the god coming down to have sex with a mortal queen, the esoteric meaning almost certainly has to do with the descent of our spiritual soul into this incarnate body in which we find ourselves in the condition that we're in, in this incarnate life, in which we're curiously a mixture of both the spiritual nature and the physical nature, but in one person. And the teaching is that we ourselves and everyone we meet is actually much more than the sum of just our physical body, as amazing as our physical body is. We know that there's something more to to ourselves, and that's true about everyone else that you'll ever meet as well. It's that divine spark coming down to dwell in the physical realm. Now, at the very same time that this ancient fresco from A.D. 79 was being uncovered in Pompeii, after 19 centuries beneath the ashes of Vesuvius, a 27-year-old man named John Allen Chow was being killed by the indigenous people of North Sentinel Island in the Andaman group in the Indian Ocean. Chow was apparently motivated by literalist Christian missionary zeal to try and reach this indigenous and protected cultural group and to convert them to his literalist Christian faith. This tragedy could perhaps have been averted if Chow had understood that the stories and figures in the Bible are not literal, but are rather they're based on the very same system of celestial metaphor that underlies the myths of ancient Greece, and indeed the very same system which underlies the sacred traditions of the Andaman islanders that he was trying to convert. For example, there's a myth related in the book published in the 1920s, Myths and Legends of the Andamans, by Alfred Reginald Radcliffe Brown. And this myth that's related in that book describes the origin of fire, according to the sacred stories of the people of the Andamans. In this myth, some dried leaves of a yam tree catch fire. A figure named Sir Pran obtains the fire from the yam leaves, but when he falls asleep, the kingfisher steals the fire. So kingfisher takes the fire and cooks a fish. But after he consumes the fish, Kingfisher also falls asleep, and this allows Dove to come take the fire and fly away with it. If we're familiar with other myths regarding the origin of fire from around the globe, which are also based on very similar figures, often involving two birds, and if we're familiar with a system of celestial metaphor underlying the world's myths, then we will immediately recognize that this Andaman Island myth is based on the same system. As with so many other myths surrounding the origin of fire, this one involves that same widest and brightest region of the Milky Way, which we've been talking about in the previous discussion, and that region does indeed play the role of a pillar of fire or a pillar of smoke in many myths and scriptures from around the globe. In this case, the fire originates with figures associated with Scorpio and Sagittarius, constellations flanking that brightest and thickest and fieriest part of the Milky Way in the region known 
as the galactic core of our own galaxy. So that branch with the dried yam leaves, where the fire originated, is undoubtedly the constellation Scorpio. Now the prawn, Sir Prawn, uh, who takes the fire, is almost certainly associated with Sagittarius. Specifically, there's a part of Sagittarius that's often called the teapot. And I've argued many times before that that outline of the teapot can also be seen as a grasshopper or locust, such as in the passages in the Bible that feature locusts as part of the story. The same insect-like outline in the heavens next to the brightest part of the Milky Way is no doubt Sir Prawn, who first takes the fire that was kindled among the dried yam leaves on the branch. But when Sir Prawn falls asleep, then Kingfisher takes the fire, and that's no doubt the constellation Aquila, the eagle, rising up above Sagittarius and Scorpio. And then just above Aquila, there's a constellation called Delphinus, the dolphin, which plays the role of the fish that Kingfisher ate in that story. This constellation, it looks like a dolphin in the sky, and it plays the role of a dolphin in some of the Greek myths, uh, but it can also take on the role of a salmon in many myths of the indigenous people of the Americas, for example, as well as in some of the Norse myths. So Delphinus can play a fish as well as a dolphin in the myth, uh, in the world of myth. So when Kingfisher catches a fish, I'm sure that is Delphinus. Then when Kingfisher falls asleep, the figure of Dove arrives to take the fire. And we've just seen that the constellation Cygnus, the swan, directly above Aquila, can play the role of a dove in myth. So I would argue that all these stories about the origin of fire that we find in various cultures are also esoteric in nature, and they're describing that same concept of the descent of the divine spark into this mortal world that we inhabit. They're not merely stories about how people in some distant past obtained fire. They're actually about the divine fire. We find uh, the same pattern in the story of Prometheus in the myths of ancient Greece, bringing the divine fire down to uh, dwell inside of men and women. So this story about the origin of fire that's recounted in that book from the 1920s shows that the myths of the indigenous Andaman people are built upon the same system of celestial metaphor found in other cultures around the world, from Australia to Africa, to the Americas, to the islands of the Pacific, the myths of ancient China and Japan, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and other cultures in Europe, including the far north and Scandinavia, literally around the world. In fact, I've demonstrated in the past that the descent of the divine spirit in the form of a dove in the story of the baptism of Christ at the start of his ministry that's described in the scriptures of the New Testament is based on this very same region of the heavens and upon the form of Cygnus, the swan, flying downwards as a dove through the bright column of the Milky Way band. In all of these different stories, the ancient myths are conveying profound truths to our understanding regarding the divine spark that is present in each and every man and woman in this incarnate life. It's truly tragic that the esoteric nature of these sacred stories has been suppressed and forgotten. I'm sure that John Allen Chow was a spiritual person who was trying to understand the mystery, the mystery of the reality of the spirit in himself and in each and every other person in the world around him, but he was grievously misled by those who teach a literal understanding of ancient scriptures, ancient scriptures that are actually celestial and metaphorical. Literalist interpretations tend to divide people from one another. 
The irony is that the same celestial system underlies the myths of the Andaman and the stories of the Old and New Testament. And that's a truth that should actually unite us and should cause people to stop trying to convert one another to literal belief in their particular set of stories. When we begin to understand the celestial language that the ancient myths are speaking, we can start to hear the esoteric message that they have for our lives. And we can begin to see the ancient artwork depicting those myths, such as the story of Leda and the swan, with new eyes, including seeing the profound and powerful message conveyed in this ancient erotic and very sensual painting from Pompeii and preserved for us by a very different tragedy almost 2,000 years before.